talking a little bit about technology here. So it reminds me of something that happened. I, I'm dating myself by telling you this, but I was on the Hill when the visitor center, the new visitor center opened. And we were moving, we have a skip space, and we were moving from one skip space down to our new uh, offices in the capital visitor center. And we had new equipment down there. And so one night, um, I'm, I'm in the space, it's late night, and um, a couple of staffers are around, and Sharon was there. And of course, we dealt with classified information all the time. And so I, I'm in um, by the FH Shredder, in the shredder room, and the chair is off with a piece of paper. Um, and he's looking at the shredder. And uh, I, I go up to him and I say, Mr. Chairman, uh, is there something I can help you with? And he said, Yeah, I, just, I don't know how to work this thing. And I said, Well, okay, I'll help you out. So I take the paper from him and I start feeding it into the shredder. And he said, That's great, Mark. I only need two copies. <laughs> so technology can, can be complicated especially in your environment. <laughs> Got to get back to the presentation here. So as we get started, uh, I want you to keep in mind two things, and I hate being trapped behind a podium, by the way, but um, the things that I'd like you to keep in mind as we talk for the next 15 minutes is as things mature, there are growing pains. I challenge anybody to tell me something of which that is not true. People, technology, organization, so keep that in the back of your noodle. Um, and the second thing is that discovery is irrevocable. We have this need to progress and to make things better. Um, so once you discover something, that's it. We cannot put the genie back in the bottle. So as all technologies mature, um, there's a couple of things that happen with all of them about the growing phase. One, there are initial limitations, um, features, for example, with tech, um, and usability. Uh, anybody, any developers in the room? So you understand, sometimes you're focused more on functionality than on usability. So um, sometimes that's a problem, but as they mature, as those growing pains subside, you get better usability. You guys broke this. <laughs> I'll get it fixed. There's a scalability problem. Uh, obviously, the more people use it, the more it's got to be able to scale uh, accordingly. Interoperability with the existing technology. Um, Cost reduction, the more it's used, the more to drive those costs down, so it's not as expensive for each institution to take the benefit. And of course, we kind of talked a lot about this today. Education, people don't know how to use it. You gotta show them what the benefit is. So we've, we've seen this. Think about um, think about when the internet first came around, we had usability issues, we had taking over the game with the internet. Um, and then mobile phones, remember. So, um, perfect, that's the right slide. Thank you very much. So, if you can read this in the eye chart in the back of the room, we have growing pains too. Um, and just take a, take a look at those growing pains. But, these growing pains are common, they're necessary, and of course they drive innovation in and of themselves. And, discovery is irrevocable. The, um, there, there's been controversies around cryptocurrency, but note those controversies and a couple of statistics. So in October, the assets, assets under management for digital asset products grew by 6.5%, more than 6.5%, to a total of $31.7 billion. The average daily aggregate volume of digital asset investment that's grown by almost 45% to $230 million. And the United States still leads with a market share of about uh, 77%. That's, that's about $24.5 billion. So these growing pains, it's clear that despite the growing pains, that there's interest and this technology is irrevocable, meaning there's no going back. Now, we can, um, especially standing here on 
because there's such strong interest in this. Discovery is irrevocable. So I want to point out just real briefly that um, I think that in this town, we talk about regulation in a homogeneous manner. We talk about Web3 and Web3 regulation in a homogeneous manner, which we should not do. Because there's money crypto, and very important, obviously, KYC, AML, all, all those things need to be addressed. But here's what we're talking about here today. There's a technology that cannot be put back in the bottle. And that's what we should be talking about more than the crypto. I think the crypto applications are important. And I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, uh, I work for a company that we have the world's most popular digital wallet, MetaMask. So it's critical. But when it comes to regulation, regulate the finance in, with one mindset, regulate the technology with another. Just real quick about um, consensus. Uh, I won't bore you with all of the mission and things like that, but what we're trying to do is empower people and communities. You've heard a little bit about that today. I, what other industry is that interested in societal well-being? I mean, I, I, spent, I, spent a, I spent two careers in the national security realm, and of course we were interested in security, and that's somewhat related to well-being, but we spend an awful lot of time talking about bomb damage assessments and blast radiuses and targeting packages rather than um, how do we make society better. In 1996, there was a great book by Francis Fukuyama, and it's called Trust. And that book says the well-being of any society is dependent on the primary social characteristic of inherent social trust. And I argue that Web3 is a new foundation of societal trust. And I like it just because I, I spent a lot of time at the National Security Agency as well, and that math was everything to us. If I couldn't prove it mathematically, it probably didn't exist. And so I love cryptographic primitives. I, I love the cryptology uh, in Web3 and in crypto. So um, that's, that's pretty much our mission um, at Consensus. Just because I'm going to be talking about wallets in general, I just wanted to introduce you quickly um, to the fact that we have a digital wallet. We have the infrastructure on which to develop other, um, not only cryptographic primitives, but also uh, products. And we've got a way to deploy it with a new L2 called Linea. Our, our, uh, we've got over 20 million um, monthly active users for a wallet that's about seven years old. More than 500,000 developers working, uh, obviously, on Ethereum. Um, and I'm, I, we didn't launch Linea that long ago, and I, I've, I've just been a little surprised at how quickly um, it's growing. So you can see the, the um, users of MetaMask, the monthly active users at over 20 million, and m almost all of our users um, are in the United States. Goes back to my point about is there any, is there any um, ignoring of this technology, and I submit that there is not. You, you can just see some use cases. You've heard about m much more dramatic use cases, but some of the ways that we talk about MetaMask is in um, the ability to move and store NFTs, uh, obviously DeFi applications, uh, metaverse applications, and AI, which um, I'll touch on briefly. The, the core of what I wanted to talk about, because what we're trying to do is solve societal problems, is a thing called MetaMask Snacks. Think of, you need a gateway to Web3, and your wallet is your gateway, a common interface. And Snaps extends that interface, um, and there's, there's lots of analogies I could use, but one, one thing that I wanted to share that at the intersection of everything that happens at Web3 is the wallet. All, what, am I, what am I talking about? Devices, distributed applications, assets, NFTs, users, developers. You can all say that the wallet is the center of, the, of gravity there. That digital wallet, it's the common interface. I do not believe that one size fits all with wallets, by the way. I mean, I have my preferences, obviously, but that does not mean that there's not room for other wallets. But I'll make the case for MetaMask snaps. Um, I'm not going to play that right now because of the problems we had before, but let me just talk about snaps real quick. When builders and users are aligned with common incentives, 
um, and, and their ability to contribute to an ecosystem together, that's very empowering. And when you have that kind of power, you've got a lot of good self-governance there. I, I think of SNAPs as somewhat of an expression of creativity um, and empowerment. Think of the wallet as your universal Web3 interface, um, empowering developers to bring innovation to wallets. But the SNAPs is, that's a platform to, do, to enable developers to build features to customize the wallet experience. And what am I driving towards there? There's a flywheel here that if I've given you a blank piece of paper, but I've given you no access to write on it, well, what good is that? So what we've done is we've got a blank piece of paper, which is your wallet, configured however you want it. And now I've handed developers a keyboard or a pencil, and they can build things that you can decide, you know what, I want that on my computer. So that common interface, that common gateway to Web3, we've given you almost, I, I, I can't come up with a limit yet, but it's almost an unlimited power to extend your wallet to whatever it is you think is necessary. Snaps. The categories of snaps you can see on the list here. And think back to what I said, that there are growing pains. I showed you some growing pains in the Web3 space. Um, Think of interoperability. We've got a, a number of snaps that en enable you to now do what was undoable before, meaning if you had a MetaMask wallet, you're transacting on Ethereum. That's it. Now you can use a snap if you want, put it into your wallet, and now you can trade with any L1 that you want. So there was the problem of, oh, look, it's, it's limited. Well, now it's not. Um, Transaction insights. This is something that we, we have not yet spoken to policymakers about this, but transactions insights, I, I have, you can see security is different from transaction insights, but I do think of them as somewhat of the same. I, I can now send, I can prepare to send money to somebody else's digital wallet, and this snap will come back and say, are you sure? That digital wallet that you're about to send that, those funds to, They've been involved in an awful lot of spooks and crime or illicit transactions, what have you, and you can decide, well, yeah, I want to go ahead or I won't. Um, and there are multiple snaps that are doing this. So let's say there's, um, I won't bore you with the, the video of the demo, but there's an example where you want to do that transaction and one of your snaps says, oh, yeah, you shouldn't do it. Okay. I can go to another snap and see what that snap thinks. By the way, all of the snaps that we have, none of them have ever disagreed. So um, to me, that, that's statistically significant. Notifications, we can get notifications from different networks. Um, there's, a, there's some privacy snaps, there's identity snaps. Um, Dale, you talked earlier, what, what a great example that you mentioned. You said the story of Sandra. And I, I won't take a lot of time to get into this now, I mean, this, what I'm about to say, we, we could talk for months on this, but the idea that you now walk into the information space with a social graph that's documentable, that you can contribute to someone else's reputation, or someone can contribute to yours, or uh, think about, um, you, you could be a member of a group, like a LinkedIn group, I do think, I mean, I, I've bought into the entire Web3 idea that now an intermediary doesn't get to control my data, I get to control my data. And so this is, the, the identity snaps um, are some of the things that, that enable you to do that. Security is obviously key for, for those of us who are nerds. Snaps run in a sandbox. So you get to set the configurations as to how much information is shared with the snap and how much SNAP gets to share information with others. Um, they're all audited, and we're going through a, um, a process to decentralize that audit process. Right now, we do it in-house, um, and we have some third parties doing it, but the idea is that eventually, it'll be like open source, 
and everybody can contribute to that. Just um, real quick, because we've spent a lot of time talking about it already, there is a wonderful um, merger between AI and Web3. One thing that does concern me, I'll, I'll be a little controversial and say, if AI is captured by centralized parties in the same way that the internet was captured by centralized parties, that is very, very dangerous, in my opinion. We already have trouble knowing well, what's the truth. Well, what should I believe? If, if, there are, if there's capture of AI, then you'll never know. You'll never know. So I think that the, the, the merger between AI and, and um, decentralized protocols is critical. We need to make sure that no centralized areas of AI exist. Just to sum it up, in the beginning, I talked about growing pains. Um, in, in Web3 and in crypto, there's the growing pains of scams, crypto fraud, illicit transactions. We, have, we not only have a wallet, but we have a way to add things to that wallet to prevent those things from happening. Tech complexity, oh my gosh, I gotta be a command line person if I'm gonna work with Web3. Nope, you can point and click your way with your wallet and a number of snaps. I don't know where to begin. Well, th there are tutorials for these snaps that'll help you know how to do that. Oh, it's too expensive. Well, especially with the Ethereum transition to proof of stake, reducing expenses on chain to uh, by 98%, um, that's kind of taken care of. And um, oh, this isn't really innovative, it's kind of the same thing as Web2. When you look at the uh, identity snap and what I talked about, taking your entire persona or personas with you, um, that's, that, that's taken care of too. All things mature, there are growing pains, and discovery is irrevocable. We all have that need to move forward in this space. Thank you.